Hey everybody, so today we are going to be walking through how LLMs and Gen AI are being used with Knowledge Graph in the publishing and content space. And today we're gonna to be talking to somebody that's in the field who has been doing this, who has lived through this for the last 15 years in the publishing space at Walters Clor. So if this is something that sounds interesting to you, if you are in the publishing and content space and you're struggling with how do these things come together and should I be worried? What's going on? This is maybe a good video for you to listen into. All right, so with that, let's go get started. Hi, um, my name is Quentin Roll. I am uh, the director of uh, AI and digital transformation as Walters Clor uh, currently. And my role has really been uh, around promoting the role of generative AI and of semantics, knowledge graph, um, to drive expert solution or to accelerate the delivery of expert solution in our products uh, at Walters Kluwer. Awesome. And so obviously this is a very hot topic right now. So, you know, we're we're all about semantics around here. So Quentin and I were talking about um, how Knowledge Graph is, you know, now this new sexy thing for the LLM space, even though it's existed for generations. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Like, how are you seeing the, the interplay right now? Yeah, um, I think that the main aspect with generative AI is that, yes, you can create content, but it cannot really identify things by ID. So if you look at um, drugs, for example, you can ask a LLM to extract the Rx norm number for a particular drug. But if you go back to the Rx nav to actually look up that, uh, that code, you will see that the code exists or doesn't exist, but at the very <laughs> least, it doesn't point to the drugs that you are thinking about. So the, that notion of what the entity is and what the identifier fire of it is not known. Great place where the knowledge graph plays a role. So um, the, the second aspect is that um, with LLMs and with the uh, retrieval augmented uh, generation is that you're missing the context. So yes, you can find that um, two entities are close to one another because they have a similar vectorization. But at the end of the day, the LLM is just there to um, suggest or predict the next token or the next word. Um, but if you're trying to have a holistic view of a domain, you're missing all of the connection to the rest. So mm -hmm. let's say now that I want like to find um, information about a particular disease, uh, I will find all of the research that relates to it. But there may be some research that are very specific that is connected either by, because it's the same author or because it's done by the same organization. Now, because you have strings in the content that don't that are not harmonized or or unique and persistent, um, you could find like information that is not relevant, or mm -hmm. you know, especially with names of people when you have John Doe like everywhere, uh, you can't really disambiguate that and, and determine whether you are speaking with the right person mm -hmm. and if you have aggregated the right information to do your summary or answering a question. I mean, that's that's the point of semantics, adding that context, right? So I'm so you and and thank you for explaining it in these very like there's one layer and then there's the second layer because I see a lot of folks who are trying to describe this either go way too simplistic or way down the rabbit hole, <laughs> right? The, the it's it's one step in front of another is what the LLM is doing is predicting what is the next sequence of of phrases but it doesn't really understand all of the context of that phrase to your point, right? So it's also depend on how you have vectorized or the chunk of data that you have uh, uh, vectorized. If you have yeah. to vectorize, you know, 500 characters or, or tokens, as opposed to 200 tokens, you're not going like to find the same relation of similarity between the two different things. Mm -hmm. Now, disambiguation is not a simple work right? no. you know a lot of people have, have worked at it for for many years we we have tried multiple times to resolve the problem but it, it's still what is going like to provide you at the end of the day with that more accurate and precise content um walter's clear we have a, a motto uh, when you have to be right so mm -hmm. it's really about making sure that when we compose an answer or when we compose some content that we deliver to a customer 
that we have all of the information that is relevant to that. Mm -hmm. We don't want to find ourselves like as being in the news, uh, often in the legal space of lawyers citing certain court cases that actually didn't exist. So we, which we is a real make- thing that happened, by the way, folks. I will put the link down below for not with Walter's Quora, but you know, lawyers accidentally using incorrect court cases because of ChatGPT. <laughs> and interestingly, it's still occurring. Like the last one yeah. was a couple uh, uh, of weeks ago or two months ago. So um, it, it's still happening. Yeah. Um, data science has done a lot of work around disambiguation and trying like, to understand um, certain problems are obviously easier to address when it comes to disambiguation. Uh, looking at countries, you know, you have not really 500 different ways to speak about a country. You have country name, you have its ISO code uh, being a two code or uh, or three code, depending on organizations. Well, it, it's a bit more complex, but it's, you know, feasible because you, you have coordinality with where something took place, mm-hmm. uh, other things. The, the real problem when it comes to disambiguation is when you're speaking about people. Mm-hmm. How do you define that John Doe in a particular court case is the same John Doe as in another court case? Mm-hmm. Or what is the um, the relation between um, an entity and another, which is the next step that you want to have in the relation linking? I will say also to add to that, though, it's not it's not just I mean, obviously, there's other areas, right, that you're not covering. And, and rightly so. There's just too many. But um, the other area that I feel like it, it it it's sorely lacking, right, is the the nebulous things that humans themselves can't even understand to to articulate. What is happiness? What is love? You know, not, not to get poetic about it, but normal humans can't tell you what that means. <laughs> So I don't know how we expect um, those uh, more nebulous things. Yeah, another example that I've been playing with quite a bit lately is artificial intelligence. And trying like, to ask all of the LLMs, Copilot or Gemini, mm-hmm. like to create for me an image that is representative of what artificial intelligence oh, yeah. is. Yep. And you will have like a, a neuron graph, or uh, which is very interesting that by its design is actually showing a knowledge graph. Because all of these interconnected neurons and uh, in connection of data points is a knowledge graph. So well, that also way- means that enough people in the world have described it that way too, right? Like that's kind of the what the LLM is doing. It, yes, totally. Yeah, and it's it's I I've done I've done similar things where I've asked it what a knowledge graph is. I've asked it, right? You know, some things that we all kind of agree on the general principles of what something is, but like that's somebody what his ontology is. You will get just as many answers. <laughs> uh, I, I remember as part of my PhD trying like to find the correct definition of what an ontology was, like from conceptualization of X to Y. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and in the end, you know, there is one from 1992 or something that Garner that everyone has been using. But if you really look on Google, everyone has got its own interpretation. Yep. And, and that has been, I think, one of the biggest problem with all of the technology. Uh, I refer to knowledge engineering as part of being uh, artificial intelligence. A lot of people in my 10 plus career before the LLMs never considered that as being data science or, or part of artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting And when I say generational thing here, I don't mean age group. I mean that there has been generations of different technology, right? Mm -hmm. And some folks, again, not an age group, um, kind of gravitate towards uh, certain generations of technology. And what I've realized is, you know, a lot of folks will say a knowledge engineer. Oh, you're not a real engineer. You try doing, you try figuring out what, um, you know, what all of these different people and their mental models are on, you know, how these two things relate to each other. And yes, can you do some some great um, statistical modeling on it? But yes, there are still going to be a lot of outliers. And guess what? Those outliers are what people are going to be asking anyways. <laughs> and so, you know, I just look at some of these things. And um, unfortunately, I've, I've seen even at some of the largest uh, companies in the world, still defining ontology as a non-technical role. And that's just so surprising to me because especially now that we're trying to connect these in to be used in 
you know, the the granddaddy of, uh, or the grandfather, I should say, because granddaddy means it's been around for a really long time. And that's not necessarily true. But grandfather could be, you know, a new but big, big un in, in the industry is the LLMs, which is a uh, very high degree of, of computational linguistics and uh, network theory and like, you name it, right? Well, sure, I, I that's think... technology. <laughs> To, to your point about science, um, one of uh, my team member um, is always saying, you know, it's as much science as it is art. Mm -hmm. um, science, in as much as you have to understand the principles, mm -hmm. you know, we were speaking about con cardinality constraint earlier, and you have to understand the implication that that has from an ontological perspective. But at the same time, do you represent a person or a lawyer as a subclass of a person or do you represent it as being something totally different that are related to each other oh my goodness you're, you're, is over time, you know. you're hit oh i'm having ptsd right now there <laughs> i spent six months of life once debating vehemently arguing with some very brilliant multiple phd people on is being an athlete a role or is it a subclass of a human? Ah! <laughs> it, right. And it's really like where, where the art comes in, but also where the domain expertise yes. and what you're trying like to represent is, is coming through. Yeah, I We have created an opera ontology like everyone does. Mm. Um, but I think that when you get to some of the approaches that are there, not to, to say that they are bad, but some of them are too much anchored in philosophical thinking. Oh, yes. Yep. Which makes it really complicated to, to apply in a business sense. Yes. And now that we're getting to a point, like I've been in the industry for 15 plus years. We started in 2010 to have, you know, discussion around ontological model. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really like around... 2015 that the enterprise was really using it like in one way or trying like to think how can i use this better um and we invented linked data we spoke about semantic web to start okay. with we have now been with knowledge graph and i think that the turning point now is really the llm mm. because the llm cannot function without the knowledge graph as we spoke earlier well it can it'll just have a whole lot of hallucinations and other problems <laughs> well well, it can if you're trying like, to create highly creative content without context or relying on context for something else. So yes. if, you're, if you're writing a story or a blog and you want it like to be informative, but also, you know, creative, it's going like, to handle that use case very well. But, you know, companies like my, my company of Walter Screwer, but uh, Elsevier and the other mm -hmm. ones, they're working with professionals. Mm -hmm. The decision that they're making out of the information that you're providing affect people, right? Yep. You have a doctor, you're giving There's a real them risk. There's a real impact. And you have to have that trust and reproducibility, right? Like, where did this come from? Like, precedence, right? Like, in, in the legal sense, this has to come from precedence and you can't make it up. <laughs> Explainability. You know, one of the big things with, um, with LLMs and um is that you never know what you're going like to get right? yeah. i've been uh, writing uh, some piece of code recently to generate my own blog because i didn't want like to use copilot uh, or gemini and just having mm -hmm. one section. and what i found was that with gemini if i ask like how many words i want or, or how long the reading time i want it to be it's always going like to return pretty much like the same thing mm -hmm. So I started like looking at the different models and you can see that really using from one model to the other, you're going like, to get totally different results. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is because of the training data. And unfortunately, you know, you don't have a lot of companies like uh, Allen Institute or mm -hmm. others that are with all more providing all of the data set. Like OpenAI mm -hmm. is very uh, untransparent. Uh, to say the least, <laughs> about what data it's using, and exactly, and they're using and they're changing over time. Like they, yeah. uh, you know, famously were uh, crawling BitTorrent website early on for for uh, GPT four, and now they've implemented additional safeguards. So you can't have a risk uh, 
replicability over time. Plus, a lot of the solution are hosted solution. Yeah. And you have no control over which exactly. version. Exactly. So you really need to have that grounding and that, you know, knowledge that is present in your knowledge graph to really be able like to, to ground like what yeah. you're going to get like the higher accuracy. Yeah. And and for those that are interested, I actually have a whole architecture on fact checking for LLMs using a knowledge graph. I'll put a link up above somewhere for that. But this is one of the other reasons that knowledge graph is so helpful in this is guess what you can do with a knowledge graph? You can put uh, the provenance. You can say where you got this from. You can say what sources agree on this statement versus other statements, right? So the LLM, you know, can can have those those um, resources and does it know exactly which resource led to this word or this this phrase being you know generated in a certain way? No, because that's how LLMs work, right? Like that is how that that blender of of content works. But what it can do and what it should do is say, okay, here are the contributing resources that are part of this model. And then the rest of us who are using it can say, okay, I, I can see that you've used a lot of reputable sources. Or I can look at it and say, why did you use all these conspiracy theory sites? I don't think I'm going to trust this thing, right? And that's where a lot of like the um, gap analysis in in the the training and what the model knows about is also important because if it has giant gaps in its understanding on something, chances are it's not going to have a very robust or very trustworthy answer on that thing, which is yeah, the other problem, right? Because some things are not well known yet. There's a lot of things in the world that are kind of sparse because they're still being developed. And I fear that you kind of open a Pandora's box here about implementation <laughs> of knowledge graph. Yeah. Uh, when it comes to, you know, if you use like something like Neo4j, that expression of the provenance that you were just mentioning is, is relatively easy because you can put uh, properties on the edges exactly. be between nodes and therefore you're not created as much content. Unfortunately, RDF doesn't do that. You have to do the reification, which... It's a totally a different problem. Uh, RDF star is obviously and hopefully going to be adopted <laughs> and be a solution to that problem. Yeah. But but that has also ended, you know, ultimately like the adaptation or the adoption of the knowledge graph. The technology is not there. You know, not, Neo4j represent about uh, forty percent of the market right now, mm. uh, with uh, Microsoft Cosmos being about thirty percent. And then you have 20 other graph database vendors yeah. that are between 1% and 4%. Yeah. Um, but I will I will say, I, I, I don't know if I totally disagree with you, or I don't know if I totally agree with you, I should say, uh, on the, the provenance piece in the knowledge graph, you know, if you're using RDF. You absolutely can do it. You just, it's it's another set of triples, right, that you would then associate with the entities or the the facts or the statements um, that are then being generated out of those sources. So you can do it. I think the problem, and I think maybe this is where you're going with it, but correct me if I'm wrong, um, mm -hmm. is that data is all getting updated in different times, right? And so something is maybe coming in at a, like all of that versioning and time series and you know all of that um, kind of uh, something is true in a certain time frame piece is not well done in in uh, a, a traditional RDF setting, I would say. Well, I think that you, that's definitely one aspect, but uh, the other aspect that I'm thinking of is really the implementation of the of, of the graph itself. Mm. Um, and as much as if you are putting these extra triples, you have certain tools for which you are going to bloat your, uh, uh, your system and trying like to do query, you, you can use name graph, obviously, to put the provenance information in a different yeah. place. But it, doing like these distributed queries is expensive too. Yes. So you have that performance aspect. Uh, you have the operational aspect that the more data you're putting in, the more you need like to have resources like mm -hmm. to put it, and the more like the cost of the operationalization is there. So it it's not you know to head on RDF that it's not addressing or that it, we should not put provenance. We have a, a 
a system where that we have created like to rely uh, to do extraction of insight based on NLP and machine learning. And we use provenance to know, well, to debug, mm-hmm. you know, so mm-hmm. simply to know that what was the, the annotators that generate some piece of information, yeah. number one, but also that if we make a change to a model, well, we, we need to know what data has been processed by that model so mm-hmm. that we can mm-hmm. process it. So it's important, um, but I'm not sure that you would put it in every place or for that every system really needs to have it. Oh um, yeah, and- I mean, that that's the thing. Like if, if you look back on, you know, oh, I hate the saying, there's so many ways to skin a cat, right? Um, but I hate that saying, it's a gross saying. Um, but in this case, you know, there's many ways to solve a solution, right? Uh, but I will say, you know, for those that are maybe um, listening in here is, it really depends on how you set up your model, right? Like even like RDF star, is it just a, a hack for um, how you model so you don't have to do reification? Yeah. <laughs> I have a whole video talking about that. Um, and it depends. It depends on, on what you're doing with it. Um, but, you know, do you need that provenance every single time you run a query? No, no, you don't. But you do need it to, as you're saying, you know, do... Um, if you have to do a retro or if you have to do a rollback or you have to decide where, you know, something went awry. Um, and also I, I use this in like the trustworthiness score of statements that are in your graph. So, so mm-hmm. each statement has a trustworthiness score and that's a different model and a different name graph. Like that. So it can be a different thing. It doesn't have to be within. Um, but again, it depends on your use case. Maybe your use case, you need it at that time of the event. I mean, it's, it, I hate being that person to say it depends on your use case, but in many things with graphic kind of is. I, I think like as a knowledge engineer, that's that's the thing that I always say. You know, we were spe- again speaking about continuity constraint earlier. Um, and before Shackle, you didn't really have anything else in the web ontology yeah. language to do that. Yeah. And what we found being such a large organization and trying... Every business that I have worked with was in Walter's career, be it in legal and regulatory, tax and accounting or healthcare, are dealing with documents. Mm-hmm. They all have a different imp- interpretation of that document. And like in some product, we have two titles. In other products, we have <laughs> three types and, and so forth. Yep. And you really cannot enforce that constraint at your higher level ontology or even at your low level ontology. Because you're just making like things too inflexible for adaptability and adoption elsewhere. Shackle is at least enabling us nowadays like to do that by providing yeah. that additional layer more on an application to application yeah. level. But I remember so many times where we had a, for one country introduced a cardinality constraint and we try like to bring the same ontology to a different country. And we had like to remove the cardinality constraint because it would have broken that other country. Yeah, because like, is XML really that used anymore? I think a lot of people have walked away from it um, because it's too costly, it's too big. Um, a lot of folks going to JSON and JSON LD and that sort of thing. But it's yeah, in the publishing world where the legacy has really been, you know, XML. Even though that's you made, all the way, uh, right? <laughs> XML, XSLTs, uh, DTDs, that's still like heavily used. Even like in some cases we use more JSON like for the metadata. But if you look at the content, a lot of publishing have not migrated to HTML. They're still using the proprietary DTDs and XSDs to to represent the data. So we have a lot of cases where, um, and we wrote a, a paper on that many years ago about what do you need to do like to transform XML to RDF XML <laughs> and leverage like these cheap tools like XSLTs to generate the um, the the RDF XML or the RDF because it's much easier than trying like to write a Java code and having to understand how your class in Java like linked to a class in your ontology and you know, and, and all of that. So um as much as I would love to say that XML is not used as, as much, uh, I still see XML pretty much every day, like in my job. Yeah, on the publishing side, um, I remember at one point um, trying to educate others on 
you know, there are standards for XML. And maybe if you use that in your ontology, um, you could suck up the data faster from all that content. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's also expensive to do this transformation. So yeah. if you have a lot of products and you have not determined 100% the way that the knowledge graph could solve a new problem, mm-hmm. would you spend the time to do the migration which is going like to not only require to change your content management system, mm-hmm. it's going to require to change your pipelines to delivery. And it's going All like of to, it has to change and it's very costly and a big, big thing. But, you know, what we were talking about, you know, off offline before I started recording, you know, it's um, it's a really difficult process to update things that are so entrenched and in legacy, and especially with so many things updating and changing, um, what ends up happening is, you know, you kind of jerry-rig it in and hope for the best, unfortunately. Or you you let someone die and you work on something new. And while uh, while you're working on something new, like you leave like the rest on life support, um, yeah. which works up until easier said than done when everyone has to work on that life support because it's such a brittle system <laughs> you know the technical debt needs to be addressed over time but it's not like the value of the technical debt is understood by the technologist yeah not necessarily by the people paying the bill yeah 